بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم اجمعين when i was asked to give this talk today i was asked to speak about marriage and i'm always just a little suspicious when they ask the women speakers to speak about marriage and i think to myself ask the male sheikh Ustad Abdullah Evans, Barakallahu Fiq, you redeemed the brothers tonight. <laughs> Mashallah. Mashallah. Inshallah, what I decided to speak about actually was when I thought about the concept of love in the Quran. Someone dear to me asked me and said, what story of love in the Quran speaks to you most? And the first thing that came up for me was a beautiful love story but a different kind of love story than we have been talking about tonight and it's not one of marriage i want you to tra- transport yourself back into early islam i want you to imagine that you are the closest friend and companion to our beloved the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and i want you to imagine what it means when you realize that there is such fear and such potential that beautiful potential of islam could be completely taken away if his life is taken away and that you are meant to be his companion and to help him migrate from mecca to medina who am i talking about sayyidna abu bakr as-siddiq And I want you to imagine that the prize for finding the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is 100 camels. You do the math and tell me what that means in today's money. And I want you to imagine that as you're taking this trek, you need to stop. It gets dangerous. And you stop at Ghar Thawr. And you stop there. at this cave and the first thing you do is try to clean out the cave so that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam can go in safely and so you plug up every hole there is with cloth pieces of cloth to plug up the holes so that the snakes don't come out to bite them that one hole was missed and when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam finally goes to sleep and puts his blessed head in your lap you see the snake and so you take your foot and put it in the hole and the snake bites you but out of your love for the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam you don't even want to move in order to not disturb his blessed sleep so you you're just so it's such in pain that all you can do is start to tear up silently silently in excruciating pain and the tears fall from your cheek onto the prophet's face sallallahu alaihi wasallam and it wakes him up and when he wakes up and asks you what happened you explain do you feel the love can you feel the pulse of this kind of love the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam took his blessed saliva and put it on sayyidina abu bakr's wound and it healed completely such is the blessing of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and when sayyidna abu bakr tells this story he says at one point we heard the footsteps of the people who were coming <laughs> and all they had they got all the way to the cave where we were in ghar thawr and all they had to do was just look down and they would have seen us but they didn't You remember why? There was the spinning of the spider web and the pigeon with her eggs. And they thought nobody went into this cave and they went off. But the Sayyidna Abu Bakr was worried because any harm coming to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam meant the potential for Islam to be gone right in its infancy. and can you imagine that this kind of love is mentioned in the quran in surah at-tauba twice you're referenced imagine you being the one referenced in the quran 
Sayyidina Abu Bakr is referenced because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِذْ أَخْرَجَهُ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا The people who disbelieved took the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam out of his home in Mecca. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to Abu Bakr by saying that he is one of thani ithnayn. He's one of the two. Imagine you being referenced to the Quran as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and you're the second. Right? Thani ithnayn. إِذْ هُمَا فِي الْغَارِ and as they are in that ghar, in that cave, this is when Sayyidina Abu Bakr says to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that he's worried, he's fearful. And what does the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say back to him? What is repeated is mentioned in the Qur'an. Imagine that your conversation with the Prophet is recorded in the Qur'an. Love. This kind of love, it's a special kind of love. And the ayah continues. إِذْ هُمَا فِي الْغَارِ إِذْ يَقُولُ لِصَاحِبِهِ لَا تَحْزَنْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ مَعَنَا Don't be fearful. Don't despair. Don't be scared. Allah is with us. Allah is with us. And not only that, the ayah continues because it says, فَأَنزَلَ اللَّهُ سَكِينَتَهُ عَلَيْهِ وَأَيَّدَهُ بِجُنُودٍ لَمْ تَرَوْهَا he sent down a sakina, a, a tranquility, a calm that took that fear and that sadness and that huzun, that despair, that sadness away. And Allah gave them junudun lam taroha, forces like angels that you can't even see. Allah is providing the entire time. What do you do with a kind of love that is so strong? That when you are the first to go public with your Islam, you get up on the mountaintop and you start talking about Islam. The disbelievers take you down and beat you up so badly that you completely lose consciousness. And when you come to, when you wake back up, the first thing out of your mouth is, is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam okay? Not just what happened to me, am I missing a nose, is my tooth gone? Is the Prophet okay? This kind of love is so strong that when you see how the Prophet وسلم, reciprocates and responds, you'll understand. Because one of the other Sahaba, of the many, there's actually several narrations similar to this, but this particular uh, narration that's in Sahih Bukhari and Muslim is on Amr ibn Abn As. And he said to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was just appointed, so he was very proud of himself. And in the Shema'il, it says, whenever the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would speak to you, he would speak to you so directly, you would think that only you were in the room and you would think that you were the most beloved person to him at all. <laughs> and so, so several of the companions would say, Ya Rasulullah, who's most beloved to you? Hoping that he'd say them, right? And so here's Amr ibn As, who's been appointed. And he asks this question. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, Aisha. He says, okay, okay, from the men, from the men. Who's the most beloved to you? He says, her father. <laughs> MashaAllah. And then he goes on. He says, and then who? Sayyidina Umar. And in a different narration with a different Sahabi, it says there, he said, I wish I had never even asked. Imagine that you are the person that is so beloved to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That you have given up your comfort. You've given up your safety. You've given up your land. You've given up your wealth. Yes, wealth, because Sayyidina Abu Bakr, one of the most important things that we know about him is how much he gave his wealth, particularly freeing of slaves. He freed Sayyidina Bilal, and he, fra he freed Ammar ibn Yasir, and so on the list goes. And imagine you are the person that once you have this Islam, you want everyone else to have it too. Imagine you're the one who brings to Islam Uthman bin Affan. Imagine that you're the one who brings to Islam as Zubair and Talha and Abdul Rahman ibn Auf and Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas. Imagine the scales. Your scales. Now, why do I mention all of this love? It says that Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu likely had met the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa when he was like 10. 
they were out on the same caravan when the Prophet ﷺ had also gone out when he was about 13. The Prophet's about two to three years older than Abu Bakr. And who knows how exactly the friendship exactly came to be. But when you think about who these two people are, when you think that the Prophet ﷺ is Al-Ameen, the trustworthy. And Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, right? When you think about how these souls, we say Junudun Mujannada, with these souls know each other when they meet each other, they're kindred spirits, they know each other as soon as they meet each other, they just mesh. And they became good friends. And when the Prophet ﷺ married Satana Khadija, they became neighbors. And when the message of Islam came. So this is what they were neighbors since he was about 25, right? And when the message of Islam came at the age of 40, years later, Sayyidina Abu Bakr heard this and said, he went straight to the Prophet ﷺ and took his shahada. This kind of love starts young. This kind of love that Sayyidina Abu Bakr had for the Prophet ﷺ is a mirror. It's a mirror because it reflects the love he has for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his commitment to Islam. It is the kind of love that we need to have for our own Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the kind of love we need to instill in our children. Now, let me tell you something. In the last several weeks, one of our dearest teachers, one of my dearest teachers, and so Sosa Naimadi had done an amazing, amazing series on parenting at the Rahma Foundation. And I want, if you've missed it, you've got to go back and listen to these recordings. It is phenomenal. She takes the milestones, the physical, cognitive, emotional, and spiritual milestones of children at every single age. And she tells us how as parents, we do a pretty good job with the physical and a decent job with the cognitive, the emotional milestones. <sighs> And the spiritual milestones of our children, we just fall right off. The reason that that series is so extraordinary, and every time I listen to it, you can't help but learn something amazing and new. When she gets to teens, I told you, the friendship between Abu Bakr and the Prophet Wasallam started young. When she gets to teens, this is where everybody's ears perks up and go, huh? You just told me we need to instill the love of the Prophet in our youth. What do we do with these kids of ours who all they have all day long is this phone in their face? I remind us the phone that we gave them, that we pay for, that we give the subscription to. Just saying. And so what does she say about these teens? I'm going to say something, maybe pushing the envelope, Pushing the envelope just a little bit here. She says, take these about 10 years or so. Let's start at the age of 14. And let's say, let's go in our field. We say transitional aged youth are until about 24. So 14 to 24. At this stage of life, now listen closely. This stage of life is called the stage of spiritual and sexual awakening. When you think about this, let it just sit for a minute, and you think about what this means, you'll realize that most of our youth, and actually by extension, you see the ramifications of this in most of our adults too, that if they did not grow that spiritual awakening in the years in which you can hit its peak and prime, which are actually your teen years, and for anyone listening to this going, what, your teen years? Absolutely. This age is an age in which you don't have the many responsibilities that are to come, but it's also the age of decision-making because you've learned so much all this time, and now you're finally making your choices for yourself, whether your parents like it or not. And the people you're listening to most often in this stage are not your parents anymore. By and large, they are the others. Who are the others? Who have you put in their path that they're turning to? Where is the suhba saliha? that strong companionship and friendship like we saw with Sayyidina Abu Bakr and the Prophet to turn them back to the spiritual awakening. You see, one can grow 
and completely stunt the other. And in this society, the emphasis is, I don't have to tell you, it's not on the spiritual awakening. Where is the emphasis? You know. Where it's being pushed and pushed and pushed. So how do you combat this? You combat it with a spiritual awakening. This is the stage where a youth can get up and actually pray in the middle of the night and feel and taste iman. Wallahi. This is the period of life where they can get up and actually feel a kind of faith and kind of love for their Lord and kind of love for Islam that they don't actually feel in other stages. It's a very special stage. So let me tell you something. Don't stunt our kids' spiritual growth and progress. Even when we see kids kind of like go a little bit, you know, sometimes it's really, really far out. If they've experienced this, they eventually come back. It's a taste that once you've experienced it, you can't forget it again. So give them this. And wallahi, if you feel the reserve, that reserve from this age, they always draw from that light and that nur for the rest of their lives. Subhanallah. And so, in closing, in closing, <laughs> I'm going to share with you a story of something that happened in the Rahma Foundation. For those who you don't know, it's a nonprofit that we have here in the Bay Area now for almost 20 years. Mashallah, we're getting there. And alhamdulillah, feeling, wallahi, the honor of having worked with so many of your daughters, actually, over the many years of our summer camps and our youth camps and our Friday night halakas and our youth halakas and so on and so forth for women and girls. And one time, I was at the masjid where we hold these events. And because we have a parallel woman's Halakha, with hundreds of women in it, at the same time that the girls are in their halakhas, hundreds of girls, mashallah, of all the age groups, four all the way to high school. And every so often I get to break away because we have a guest speaker. And I think, you know, as I go through the masjid and kind of want to just look in and peer and listen into what's happening in the different girls groups, I feel like Sayyidina Umar. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it was like, may Allah make us like Sayyidina Umar, <laughs> who, who, who when he would go and walk through the village at night to hear because you know it's the same thing a lot of these rooms are like cubicles so you can hear even if you can't see what the girls are saying inside and I would walk through and kind of see how things are going and one day one day subhanallah one day I heard these group of girls they range from like age 12 to maybe 16 ish and they're behind the cubicle so I can hear them but they can't see me and I can't see them and I'm walking through and one of them said we have to figure out how to get how to go. And I said, Khair, inshallah, go where? Where are these girls thinking they're gonna go? And they said, We've got to, we've got to, we've got to convince our parents to travel. This is pre-COVID. <laughs> and so I stopped. I was kind of interested to see where is this conversation going? And they said, we have to figure out where to go study. And I just stopped. Wallahi in my tracks. You know, when you kind of have that moment where you just like everything freezes in time. The kind of good companionship and the kind of role modeling, for those of you who know me, know that I've studied in Syria when I was a young girl. I was about 14 when I first went overseas to study Sharia. Since we mentioned Syria, please make dua, please, for Syria and all, all of the ummah, ya Rabb. Allahumma ameen. And the story is often shared with the Rahma girls that their teacher went to go study, and inshallah, you should too. So these girls are making plotting and planning and I thought, what are they going to say? And they said, we're going to go to Turkey. <laughs> I thought, wow, Turkey is the new Syria. Mashallah. And the funniest conversation, the most comical conversation happened after that. One of them said, hey, you know how to make pasta, right? So we'll be okay. <laughs> and the other one said, no, no, no. She didn't forget pasta. She knows how to cook. We'll be and the other one said, you're turning 16 soon. You're going to be able to drive. So you'll drive us around Turkey. And they're having this whole conversation of how they're going to study in Turkey. And they finally get to the point where they say, but who are we going to study with? <laughs> the Quran and the Islam. And I thought to myself, subhanAllah. Wallahi, right then, I literally melted into the ground of the masjid floor. Yeah, and you had to pick me back up because I thought, subhanAllah, we have three rules at Rahma. Three rules. You come here on Friday nights to learn about, to, to, to grow in your sisterhood together. And here was a group of sisters. They were all in different schools, but on Friday nights, they found their Muslim sisters, right? 
that you grow, number two, that you grow in your love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that you grow in your love for Islam. And that's it. If you gain more out of it, alhamdulillah. But if you got those three, you got love. <laughs> and you got the kind of love that's going to help you in the spiritual awakening and keeping you through. And so, inshallah, my dear sisters and my brothers, please, inshallah, if as everything you have been hearing here at this program tonight, all types of different love that you've heard, if you feel that it is lacking in your life, either in your marriage or in your parenting or with your kids or with yourselves, on the spiritual side, please reach out to the programs that are like Miftah, like the Rahmah Foundation, like the others. And of course, in my, um, the Miftah brothers, may Allah bless them and increase them, have allowed me to give this service announcement and I'm very blessed to give it. If it is more than that and you feel that you need extra help, you know that I'm not going to leave the stage before telling you that if you need the extra help, reach out for help. Some of the issues that are happening are definitely spiritual. And some of them are on the needs of mental health. And please know that the two are connected. I'm very happy and honored to tell you that after a bit of a gap, alhamdulillah, we now have Maristan. Alhamdulillah in the Bay Area. Allah. I'm really, really blessed. Alhamdulillah. I'm <laughs> it's a real, real blessing to have, inshallah, an organization that's going to be focused on kind of the Muslim mental health and the Islamic psychology. And I want to tell you, and that's here to stay, and it's from the Bay Area, and it's not going anywhere, inshallah. <laughs> inshallah. And I also want to tell you, my dear sisters and my brothers, the table is outside. And take it, please take your bookmark before you leave, inshallah. And reach out. If it's not for you, then it's for somebody else in your family or friends. Wallahi, the kind of love we've been talking about here is possible. But sometimes we do need that extra help. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow for all of us to have the kind of spiritual awakening and to go forward with it. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.